Good evening and welcome again to Crime Watch UK. Tonight we're hoping you can help police with 16 cases they're investigating across the country. As usual, the detectives behind us are manning the phones, waiting to take your call if you see anything you recognise in the next 45 minutes. The number, as usual, direct to the studio here is 01 811 8055. This month's reconstructions, gunfire on a Manchester street as failed robbers take out their frustration and a courageous motorist who set off in pursuit. The murder of a harmless tramp, how someone set on Michael Fahey in what seems to be an unprovoked and motiveless attack. And the booking office robber, the highly agitated man who's been raiding railway stations and the booking office clerk who wrestled a loaded gun away from him. The first of our reconstructions tonight is an attempted robbery on a security van in the Manchester area four weeks ago. One of the security guards was shot at and injured, even when it was already quite clear to the gang that their robbery had failed. In the film that follows, we've left out certain details for security reasons. And our reconstruction begins on the outskirts of Manchester. At about a quarter past 11 on the morning of Saturday, March the 18th, the owner of this Ford Sierra 4x4 stopped at a car wash on Brandlholme Road in Tottington in the Berry area. He left the keys in the ignition while he went to buy a token to put in the machine. In the few moments that took, his car was stolen. A few miles away, next to the Hustler Snooker Club in Droylsden, tucked away behind a wooden fence, is a public car park. Sometime between two and three o'clock that same afternoon, a transit van, which had been parked there most of the day, disappeared. It's a quarter to six, a couple of hours before closing time, at the Tesco Superstore in Walkton. After four o'clock every Saturday, there's a discount on perishable goods here, so the store was packed with people as usual. Opposite the store is a pond known locally as the Lodge. At 10 to 6, a security call van pulled up at a side entrance to collect the takings. One of the managers let the security guard in to begin his collection. The whole operation took just over 10 minutes. The lodge pond is popular with anglers, so a passing police patrol weren't unduly concerned seeing a man in waterproof clothing standing on the other side of the road. The manager remembers noticing him too. Motorists saw the blue transit drive out of Tesco's car park. Out of bed! Come on! Come on! The van's security arrangements made it impossible for the gang to break into it. Realizing he was watching a robbery, the motorist sounded his horn to attract attention, then cautiously drove after the blue transit. Phone the police, tell them there's been a robbery at Tesco's.
The next day, the Sierra was found abandoned near some allotments behind Harcourt Street, less than a mile from the Tesco store. Well, Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Knupfer is leading the investigation. Now, one of those guards was actually injured. Is he getting better now? That's correct. He is recovering from his injuries, but Security Corps have offered a reward of £10,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the offenders. Right. Apart from the Tesco's manager and the motorist who gave chase there, are there any other witnesses? Yes, indeed. There were a number of witnesses who uh, saw the robbery take place, but we would like to hear from anyone else who either witnessed the actual robbery or saw the transit van parked in Tesco's car park immediately beforehand. What about the Sierra 4x4? Yes, both vehicles were stolen earlier the same day, and uh, we would like to hear from anyone who actually witnessed the thefts of the vehicles or saw them in between the theft and the robbery taking place later mm -hmm. that, that afternoon. So we're talking about sightings of the Ford Sierra and the transit van on Saturday the 18th of March, and that day only because the cars are back with their rightful owners That's now. That's correct, yes. Right. Now, the robbers left behind various articles which could be important clues. Indeed, yes. Uh, in addition to this blank training hand grenade, um, they left a number of items of fishing tackle behind. One was this uh, fishing stool, folding stool, and the other, or another, was this rod case, fishing rod case, which you can see has a, a badge, a Sex Pistols badge on it. Uh, we would be delighted to hear from anyone who knows the origin of this bag or can, indeed can give us any information about it. The Sex Pistols badge there dates it a little. It must be a few years old by now. It's quite possible, but the bag looks as if it has had little use. Right, so somebody might recognise that as a valuable lost stolen property. That's right. um, one more appeal to make you have on events leading up to the robbery, the attack. Yes, in the three weeks preceding the robbery, a witness saw two men drive into the area in a red Ford Escort. Um, the two men were again dressed as fishermen and they were seen to observe the collection of cash by Security Corps and as soon as the uh, collection had been completed they were seen to leave this, the area. And what do they look like? Yes, one is, is uh, over six feet tall and has black uh, or dark hair with a heavy moustache. Uh, the second one is five feet ten tall, he's 25 to 30 years of age and uh, has mousy hair with a, a thinner moustache. The witness noted that both were dressed as fishermen, but she thought they were a bit too well dressed for fishermen. Uh, in other words, that, that she didn't think they were genuine fishermen. Right. Well, it sounds as though these, those could be the man who were planning to do the, the attack. It's quite possible, yes. Well, if you know anything that might help find this gang, phone us here in the studio, please, on 01811 8055, or you can phone the incident room direct on 061 855 5310. That's 061, the code for Manchester, 855 5310. That has been good progress since last month's crime watch with four arrests so far and one man charged with murder. There was a tremendous response on the attack on a courting couple in Tunbridge Wells. A peeping Tom who had been pestering couples for months had turned from a nuisance into an armed rapist. 320 viewers rang, some reporting other incidents involving prowlers and some giving names of suspects. In particular, police would like to speak to one woman who rang the studio on the night of the last programme. She was very distressed but she gave a name. Now, if that was you, will you please ring us now? Please do. 01 8055. There are new leads, too, on the smash and grab raid at a jeweller's in Middlesbrough. Despite attempts to stop them, the gang escaped with £26,000 worth of rings. Here, too, detectives are checking individual suspects suggested by Crime Watch viewers. And police say they're delighted with help they've had in hunting the murderer of Lionel Webb. Lionel, an estate agent, was shot dead in his office in North London in a crime that might have links with drug dealing. Several viewers rang anonymously with information on the drugs and most of those have kept in contact with the police. As a result, Detective Inspector Bill Cutts, who is in charge of the investigation, says he now has two vital pieces of new information. He's also found more people who were in the area at the time of the killing, including a young girl who'd been passing the office but he'd like a caller who's rung twice to call again. It's the viewer who had information about a couple who were coming out of Lionel's office at 5.45 on the night of the murder. Well, also in last month's programme, we showed the picture of a man wanted in connection with a series of deceptions which have taken place all around the country over the past four years. A viewer watching the programme in Bridlington thought she recognised the photo as the man she'd seen in the local fish and chip shop earlier that same day. She contacted her local police and as a result, a man was arrested at that chip shop the next day. He's now remanded in custody, charged with five cases of deception. 
Well, now to photo call, a portrait gallery of people police would like to speak to. Some of them caught in the act by security cameras. See if there's anyone that you recognise tonight. To introduce them, here's Superintendent David Hatcher. First, a robber who was caught on a security video as he held up a building society in Southampton on the 17th of March. He handed a plastic bag over the counter, pulled out a knife, threatened the cashier with it and demanded money. He's described as six foot tall, between 25 and 30 years old, with dark hair and a moustache. He was wearing a distinctive sweatshirt with life printed on the chest. A reward is being offered, so if that face is familiar to you, please call us. Next, we'd like your help in tracing this man, Jack Chandler. We believe he may have information about a series of thefts and deceptions totalling £150,000 across the south of England. You may know Jack Chandler as Paul Stephen York, or Paul Hardy, Richard Terence Hardy, Paul Scott, or David Allen Beck. That last name may well have been thought up because of a particular liking for Beck's beer. Indeed, he's described as having a large beer gut, as well as being 54 years old, about 5 foot 8 inches tall, with grey hair. He's well spoken and has expensive tasting clothes. If you can help, please get in touch. Colleagues at Finchley in North London need your help in identifying this man. He was captured on security film as he carried out a robbery at the TSB bank in Watling Avenue, Burnt Oak, in Edgware on the 28th of March. He produced a gun from inside a rolled up newspaper. He then ordered the cashier to fill a plastic bag with money and escaped with £1,600. He's in his mid to late 20s, tall with mousy brown hair which is receding at the temples. The cashier remembers that he had tattoos on the back and knuckles of his left hand. Ring us if you recognise him. And we'd like to know the whereabouts of this man, Donald McKnight. Officers from West Yorkshire want to speak to him about a series of thefts across the north of England in which women are befriended in public houses and their cash and jewellery stolen. McKnight is 52 years old, tanned with dark brown hair and a beard. He has a Yorkshire accent and is always smartly dressed. Call us if you can help with this or any of our other photo call faces. And the number here in the studio is 01811 8055. 01811 8055. Now to Bristol and what may have been the most callous form of crime, a murder for the hell of it. A man who was a harmless, hopeless al alcoholic was hit on the head for no known motive. Police fear the killer or killers might strike again. It happened on the night before January's crime watch, Wednesday, January the 11th. Were you in Bristol then? Our reconstruction begins in the city centre near the Broadmead shopping area. Radio Bristol News. It's nine o'clock. This is Norman Rickard. The Civil Aviation Authority has ordered new safety checks following the M1 plane disaster on Sunday night. The Stokes Croft Roundabout is a popular meeting place for the city's homeless. They call it the Magic Roundabout. One of the regulars was Mickey. He never ate much from one week to the next. Drink. That's as much as he did from one bottle to the next. It was mostly cider, but when funds were low, they had been known to drink meths, and lately he was drinking cider with Dettol. Mickey came from Stoke Gifford, not far from Bristol, and he'd worked in various labouring and farming jobs. This is him seven years ago at his sister's wedding. His parents had both died, as had his handicapped brother. Mickey lived with his sister for a time, but started drinking heavily, and soon afterwards left home. Because he stooped, he looked noticeably short and was known as Mickey Mouse, or Metal Mickey. He was only 33, but he seemed older. Mickey was really a very ordinary sort of chap. Obviously, his life had been blighted by alcohol. We'd known him for oh, five and a half years, and in that time, we'd seen him deteriorate physically and obviously deteriorate. His trousers were always longer than his legs and under the, under the heels of his shoes. Um, very shuffling gait. Uh, as his physical condition deteriorated, his, his walking became worse and worse. Mickey was a nice popular chap. Um, I remember in particular when one night I was doing the night shelter, I'd lost my purse. And Mickey was the first chap to offer me 50 pence for my bus fare home in the morning. And thereafter, whenever I saw him, he would always give 20p, 30p, 
whatever change he had for our funds. He used to use our night shelter a couple of times a week, but more recently he tended to s skip her. That means sleeping rough wherever you can find a place. The Sunday before he died, it was quite obvious that he and the little group that he moved around with had been on quite a binge for several days. On the day he died, I'd gone over to the charity shop, oh, sometime after two o'clock in the afternoon, and I noticed from the window that on the bit of waste ground there was a fire which was blazing you know, quite, quite bright and quite strongly. Oi! You two! Put that out! It's dangerous! Mickey was lying on the ground. Shortly afterwards, another witness remembers seeing Mickey and talking to his friend. Hey, darling. Want an MP for a cup of tea? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, there you go. A cigarette? Yeah. You got another cigarette for me, mate? There you go. Oh, God bless right. you, darling. Hey, Mickey. Got a ciggy for you. Maybe Mickey left the fire. A social worker is convinced she spoke to him 10 minutes walk away. Um, I actually saw him as, as I was leaving about half past four as the day centre was closing and we had a, a chat and he was playing around with my lights, pretending to switch them on and off and that was the last time I saw him. Later, back in Picton Street, this witness, who'd known Mickey for 12 years, remembers seeing him lying dangerously close to the fire. There are several popular restaurants in this part of Montpellier. Did you pass through the area that night? A couple on their way to a meal recall hearing a muffled argument on the waste ground. The fire appeared to have gone out. Then at about 10.30, something unusual happened. You a taxi? Yeah. Have you got a radio? Yes. We'll phone the police quick. I want them three men arrested. Who were they and who was the woman? The driver only called the police the following morning. Shortly afterwards, the couple walked back from their meal. Strange place to keep down for the night. There was only one man now and he was lying flat on his back. Next morning, Mickey was found dead. But now his body was on top of the remains of the fire. He'd been battered on the head. Later that morning, the police received an anonymous phone call. Force Communications. Yes. Picton Street, yes. The caller said he'd seen two men hurrying away from the waste ground at about 10.45 the previous night. The two were described as in their mid-twenties, one about 5 foot 10 tall, while the other was shorter and stockier. Police urgently need that caller and the men to contact them. I feel very much it's a tragedy that we all share in. We're part of a society that, that pushes alcohol at people and then despises the folk who, who can't handle it. Uh, Mickey was that sort of person. And I would just be concerned that people don't think, oh, it's a tramp, it's a drunk, you know, it's not important. It's very important. Ray Sargentson, why would anyone do this? Well, it's a wicked motorist murder. All I can think is somebody has done it for kicks. And this is a man who had nothing, caused no harm to anybody, and in spite of his lifestyle, certainly didn't deserve to die in the way that he did. If it was young men out after pub closing time who went in for a bit of tramp bashing, as you suspect, that anonymous caller, who was obviously public spirit enough to, to recognise that he might have seen something important, he could be absolutely key to this investigation. Well, I think he could well be the key, because from our other inquiries, we are fairly confident that he, in fact, saw the killers leaving the site. Now, he rang you on the Thursday morning. That's, that's the 12th of January. It's a long time ago, but you badly want to get in touch with him again now. Yes, we do. He's a very public-spirited gentleman. He rang in. He's given us good information. We'd like him to be just a little bit more public-spirited and ring us with his name and address. Now, what about those three men who were seen running away, the woman running after them? Were they involved? Well, we don't know. We're very anxious to trace her as well. She's in the scene, very close to where the body was found. It's vital that we find her. She may well have seen the killers doing something to Mickey, or it may be innocuous. But until we've got rid of her, then we really do need to get a uh, hold of her and find out what she's got to say. OK, so if that was you who called the taxi driver and said, please get the police, please ring us now, 01811 8055. Also, if it was you running away, Frankly, I take it you're not interested in minor misdemeanors. This is, this is a murder inquiry. That's right. I mean, innocuous sort of 
high larking, sky larking, mucking about. It's not of our interest. We are trying to trace the killers of Michael Fay. The taxi driver said there were a lot of people around that, that time on that night, 35 people maybe. Yes, we traced a lot of people, but clearly we've got a lot of unidentified people seen in the street by persons who have come forward, and I do anxiously urge anybody who's in the area, even if they feel they saw nothing, to come forward and help. OK, the date is Wednesday the 11th of January. The time is 10.30 to 11pm, around pub closing time. Here's the number if you were there, if you can help in any way, 01 811 Or you can call the incident room direct, that's on 0272 267 992. That's 0272, the code for Bristol, 267 992. And we're just hearing now that um, we've had a caller who's already actually rung twice to say that he or she knows who that man disguised as a fisherman with the gun is in the Manchester Security Corps raid. And the officer in charge, Mr Nupfer, is anxious that he calls again, he or she calls again. Please, we do need some more details on that. Some more news on last month's programme. We appealed for information on a man wanted in connection with a number of thefts of lorries and their loads. Not as a result of Crime Watch, but of a routine check on a car. A man has been arrested and charged with theft and deception. And again, not due to the programme, a man has been arrested in connection with a building society, several building society robberies in Essex and in Scotland. He's now been charged with 11 cases of robbery and one firearms offence. Two weeks after our last programme, there was a hold-up at a building society in London's Regent Street. Members of the public pursued a man onto a passing bus where an off-duty police officer arrested him. The man has since been charged with 19 cases of robbery and 18 firearms offences. These include a robbery that we showed on Photocall, where a smartly dressed man produced a gun at a building society branch in Harrow. The man in custody has now, in addition, been charged with murder. And you might remember the two child-sized Porsches, a BMW and a Mercedes that were stolen. A viewer from Middlesex called during the programme to say that he'd recently bought three similar cars from a man who'd been posing as a salesman with a brochure illustrating the cars to prove it. The three cars were delivered that same night. It seems they were stolen to order. So three of the four cars have now been recovered. The search for the thieves goes on. Now that was a case from last month's incident desk. This month, can you help to find up to a million pounds worth of antiques stolen from George Washington's house? In Kent, the attempted kidnap of a 14-year-old girl as she did her paper round. An unusual golf club which could lead to two building society robbers. And the mechanical toys which walked away from a museum in Kidderminster. With the details, here's David Hatcher. First, we hope these clothes may help my colleagues in Kent to identify the attacker of a young girl. At about 7am on the 10th of February, a 14-year-old girl was finishing her paper round in the village of Pluckley near Ashford. As she walked up the front path of a house in Forge Lane, a masked man leapt from behind a pile of logs and hit her repeatedly with a piece of wood. The logs had been deliberately arranged to form a hide. Luckily, a woman walking her dog nearby heard the girl's screams and pushed the attacker off. He ran back into Forge Lane and we think he got into a small red van, similar to a Datsun or Astra. He's probably white, between 18 and 35 years old, and of athletic build. A major part of the investigation has been to trace the origins of these clothes which the attacker took off as he rang. These blue overalls were owned by British Rail until last year. They'd shrunk and were discarded. Where have they been since last October? Both this jumper with the lion and this black t-shirt had light coloured paint spattered on them. This disposable lighter was found in the pocket of the overalls and this spanner was found behind the logs, probably left behind by the attacker. Do you know who owns them? Thanks to the prompt action of the woman passing, the young girl wasn't seriously injured. But if the attacker hadn't been disturbed, we're certain the crime would have been even more serious. If you've any information, don't hesitate, ring us now. Next, the burglary in Northamptonshire. This is Salgrave Manor. It's open to the public and is the ancestral home of George Washington, the first American president. Sometime during the night of March the 30th, at least two thieves got into the house through an upstairs window using a ladder. These 18th century clocks are the 80 valuable antiques which they stole from the house. Also taken with a 17th century wassail bowl and this breech's Bible, which was leather bound and dated from 1599. The antiques may have been taken away in these grey plastic bin liners because some were left behind. 
The total haul may be worth up to a million pounds. If you've been offered these antiques or can help with any information, please call us now. Next, Bristol police need your help to find a rapist. He broke into a student's room in the Redland area of Bristol at about 4.15 on the morning of the 11th of March. Earlier that evening, the student had been helping to raise money for comic relief by calling in local pubs. She's helped to compile an artist's impression of her attacker, and he's described as of medium height, between 20 and 25, slim build, with short cropped, mousy hair and exceptionally round eyes. The rapist stole the money she'd raised, £136, and also took an electric radio alarm clock which had a built-in portable radio cassette like this one. This particular gadget is quite unusual, as there are only two outlets for them in the southwest. A few hours before the attack, at about 12.45am, a man was seen hanging around the nearby Old Bristol Maternity Hospital. He's of similar description to the attacker. At the moment, he's not been eliminated from the inquiry and Bristol police urgently need to speak to him. So if you recognise him or know anything about this case, please give us a call now. Next, colleagues in Sussex need your help in catching two robbers. They raided the Abbey National Building Society in Hove, Sussex on the 20th of March. After holding the staff hostage, the robbers got away with £22,000 in cash, as well as American Express travellers' checks and Abbey National blank checks. They left in a blue Vauxhall Belmont car, the registration number D170WUF. That had been stolen one month earlier, on the 24th of February, from a car park in New Haven. It was spotted four days later in New Street, Worthing, and was found after the robbery in Alice Street, Hove, about a mile from the Abbey National. Did you see it in the month in between? The robbers also stole some very expensive golf clubs, like this one, from the car's boot. They were made by the company Taylor Made and have a distinctive logo. The robbers left behind a number of items in the car, including these calculators, a pin hammer, and a parking ticket from Horsham Council. The Raiders are in their mid-twenties, both white and about five foot nine inches tall. One man has a spotty complexion and short black spiky hair. The other has mousy brown hair cut in a wedge style. If you know these men or recognise any of the items, please get in touch. Finally, the raid on a toy museum in Worcestershire. This struck me as really unusual. It's a peddler doll. All her wares, including her kettle, socks and ribbons, have been faithfully recreated. It's similar to one stolen during a burglary at the Hereford and Worcester County Museum at Hartlebury Castle near Kidderminster. Late on the evening of Tuesday the 4th of April, the museum was broken into, and an assortment of antique toys and porcelain figurines was taken. These are similar to the ones stolen. As well as the peddler doll, there were dolls made in the Victorian age, mechanical toys, and some charming Staffordshire porcelain. During the raid, one of the burglars cut his hand or forearm. Blood was found at the scene. And about 11 p.m. that night, a small white van was seen in the driveway of the castle. The reward being offered may help to get our peddler lady back. So if you've any information about this or the other incident desk cases tonight, please ring us now. And a reminder of the number once again, it's 01 811 8055. 01 811 8055. In the three or four months since Christmas, a lone gunman has been raiding railway stations south of London. He's made little money, but he's brought terror to people's lives, and there could be worse to come. He seems nervous and unpredictable, and his gun is loaded. Our reconstruction begins three days before Christmas. It's 6.25 in the evening at Thornton Heath. One sixty, please. Thank you. Sorry. How much is your platform ticket? Me, you've been waiting on them for years. Glancing through the spy hole, she thought she saw the ticket collector. Be quiet, be quiet. Get back. Shut up. Now fill this. I'm 
not gonna hurt you. Just lie down. Six weeks later, this Golf GTI was stolen from St George's Square near Victoria Station. That's the main terminus for trains from Thornton Heath. Ten days later, and 4 a.m. at Tulse Hill Station. It's three miles from Thornton Heath. When detectives spoke to the station's staff, they confirmed that nothing had been stolen or tampered with. So what was the break-in for? Five days on, Tuesday the 21st of February, 5.30 in the morning. The gunman seemed to know where everything was. Don't want to die for someone else's money, do you? Hurry up! Okay, okay. Come on. Hurry up. Move it. Come on. That's a lot. Hold it. Quickly. Just up the line from Tulls Hill and from Thornton Heath is Clapham Junction. It's ten days since the Tulls Hill robbery. At 6.30 in the morning, staff arrive to start their shift at the Winstanley Road entrance. See you later. Don't forget the milk. As every day, the booking office clerk went across the road to collect his milk. Yeah, one pound, please. Can I help you? I'm all right, okay? Where do you want to go? I told you, I'm okay. It was the same red GTI that was stolen from near Victoria. And that's where the GTI was dumped, a mile from Clapham Junction Station. And obviously, it's a key point of appeal. John O'Donnell, it was stolen on the 6th of February from Pimlico, therefore it was missing for a month somewhere, presumably in South London and obviously being used by an armed robber somewhere in that area throughout that period. There's the registration, uh, ALY 552Y. If you saw that uh, GTI between uh, 6th of February and the 3rd of March, let us know. This is the gun. Yeah, as you saw, obviously he's becoming more and more violent. This is the gun that was taken from him at Clapham Junction. You can see on here, on the stock, it's very, very heavily engra engraved. It's a uh, a Belgian gun and it says O Frankoft there. There's a very slapdash repairs taken place on the stock here yep. uh, and again somebody may know about that. 
obviously the, the gun has been sawn off at the end there and the original owner probably won't know anything about that. Our robber now has another gun, having lost this one. He has, yes. This, this one, which was taken from him, in actual fact was, we know was loaded and obviously very nearly went off during the struggle. You saw the very violent struggle. As you say, unfortunately our story doesn't end there. It's becoming more and more violent. We now know that uh, last Wednesday night at Red Hill, a woman saw a man fitting the description of our armed robber get out of a Red Astra at Red Hill Station just after 10 o'clock. Now the registration number of that, she took part of it, which was C, she doesn't know the numbers, but certainly it was BLO. That was a Red Astra, and as I say, it was the same description as our armed robber. And there was an attack at Red Hill? Yes, just about 10.15, the, the male and female booking clerk They'd done their day's work, they were closing up the booking office, and as the woman un opened the door to leave the office and secured it, she was bashed in the face by this armed robber. She fell backwards. The, they were both threatened with by the same robber, same description, but this time he's got a, a black handgun, a revolver. Now, the description is, is so surprising because he's always wearing this piece of sticky tape it's this quite, plaster on the bridge of his nose and very unique. very thick pebble glasses in fact the video fit perhaps doesn't doesn't show because it's face on how thick the lenses appear to be at any rate in those glasses in each of the cases the th thick glasses and the sticky plaster on the nose in fact that's why the woman remembered him at red hill parking his car it looked as though he got a white nose in fact um, he's becoming more and more violent He's using increasing violence on these people and uh, what we're afraid of is that eventually he's going to either fire the weapon or injure them in some other way. OK, well that uh, sticky plaster of course could be hiding some feature of his face, uh, the glasses could be a disguise. But if you think you know who it is, please call us urgently, 01811 8055, 01811-8055. Remember, there's a reward in this case of uh, £5,000 on conviction. You can call British Transport Police if you want on 01380 1400. That's 01380 1400. Well, now back to Superintendent David Hatcher with another file of faces whom police would like to interview in connection with their inquiries. First, do you recognise this man? His name is George Edward Bell, and my colleagues in Taunton, Somerset, believe he may have some vital information about a series of frauds from which nearly £1.7 million has been obtained. We know that between April 1986 and December 1988, Bell set up four companies, three in the West Midlands and a garage business in Taunton. He's described as 5 foot 10 inches tall, slim, with shoulder-length grey hair and a tattoo of a pigeon on his right arm. He sometimes calls himself John George Bell, and if you know his whereabouts, please ring us now. Next, this man is being sought by London's Flying Squad officers. He's seen here in November in the Nationwide Anglia Building Society in Haringey. The staff saw that he had a handgun tucked into his trouser waistband. He passed over a note demanding money, but the staff refused to give him any, and he left empty-handed. We think that the same man has committed two further armed robberies in London, the most recent on the 7th of February at a bank in Westbourne Grove. He looks about 35 years old. He's 5 foot 8 inches tall, with brown wavy hair and an Irish accent. So far he's got away with over £2,000. Call us if you recognise him. Next we'd like to speak to Anton Reardon about the murder of a man in West London. On the evening of the 4th of March, 28-year-old Ronnie Regist died of stab wounds to the neck. He'd been staying at Lavenden House on the Lisson Green Estate in Paddington. Reardon is 30 years old, 5 foot 7 inches tall and stocky. He has light brown curly hair and a half inch scar above each eye. If you know where he is, please get in touch. And finally, we'd like to talk to Alan Ross Doherty, who might have information about the theft of checkbooks and cards from university students in Oxford. Over the last four years, the total value of cheques stolen and fraudulently cashed has been over £20,000. In Lewisham, South London, as recently as a month ago, stolen cheques from an Oxford student were being used in a number of shops. Doherty is five foot nine inches tall, stockily built, with brown eyes and thick black hair going grey. He talks with a soft Scottish accent. If you've seen him or any of our photo call faces, please call us now. And the number, of course, 01811 8055. That's 01811 8055.
and we're getting a lot of calls this evening. We've had uh, some in particular of, of great interest a South on the Southampton robber, the photo call case. We've had a large number of calls, all identifying this man. It's the one with, if you might remember, with the sweatshirt with life printed on the front. The officer in charge is particularly keen for one distressed caller to call again for more details. On the Michael Fahi murder, a woman has called claiming that it was she who flagged down the taxi having seen those youths running away from the patch of waste ground where Michael Fahi's body was found. The officer in charge would very much like her to call again. We do need more details and the call will be in confidence. Also, there's a caller who's rung giving the name and address of somebody who's been bragging that they know the full story behind Michael Fahi's murder. So um, we're hoping that we can get more details from that. We also had a call from uh, somebody on a case from last month. That was the Middlesbrough jewellery robbery where £26,000 worth of rings were stolen. Well, somebody has rung to say that they know something very important about that. We can't actually give you any more information at the moment. Suffice it to say that uh, investigating officers are at the moment on their way to investigate that call. And as our calls continue to come in, we're going to be able to give you more news, I hope, in our update programme at a quarter past 11 after question time. The lines here will be open until midnight, so if you haven't got through yet, please do keep trying. The numbers of the Investigating Police Force Headquarters are on CFAX, page 186, or you can write to us if you like at Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London, W12 7RJ. If you can't stay until our update tonight, there'll be an up-to-the-minute re progress report tomorrow morning on open air at 11.40, and we'll see you next month on Crime Watch on Thursday, May the 11th. It's perhaps ironic that we show you some of the most serious crimes each month and then end by saying, don't have nightmares. But it's just because these cases are unusually serious that police especially need your help. Despite the news tonight, violent crime is still a much smaller risk than many of us imagine. So don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.